everyone. This is the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for January 10th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and Adafruit sponsors me to work on CircuitPython, which is a variety of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython Dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. And uh, early warning, next weekend's, excuse me, next week's meeting will be held a day late because in the U.S. we will be observing Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday. Uh, I mentioned the notes doc. It accompanies the meeting and recording. We add timestamps to it to go with the video so you can skip to the parts that interest you the most. And as we uh, tend to go over 60 minutes, sometimes it is a really great option to have. After each meeting, we post a link to the next notes document in the CircuitPython Dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc and add your notes throughout the week, or at least in advance of actually starting the meeting. And if you wish to participate but can't attend, uh, you can leave your hug reports and status updates and just mark it uh, that we need to read it out loud for you. So, the structure of this meeting, we hold it in five parts. And next up is community news, a look at all things CircuitPython and Python hardware in the community. It also functions as a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Next up after that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a statistical overview of the whole project, a chance to look at things by the numbers, separate from what we're each up to. Next up, uh, and the first participatory section is called Hug Reports. We uh, take an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and recognize the awesome people all, our, all around us in the community on Discord, the forums, GitHub, YouTube, Twitter, and beyond. Uh, even the real world can apply. The fourth part is Status Updates, the opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing uh, since the last meeting and what you'll be up to until the next time we get together. And then the last part, if there are items, and I haven't checked, is called In the Weeds. If we need to do a more long-form discussion, uh, something that you've identified uh, beforehand, or something that comes up during status updates, this is the place to do it. Um, and add just at least a placeholder as to your topic uh, as early as you can, and we'll cover them in the order that they are in the document. And that is how things are going to go. So next, we will turn to community news. And uh, topping the list is the CircuitPython in 2022 survey. As 2022 starts, Scott Shawcroft, lead CircuitPython developer, requests the Python on hardware community take time to share their goals for CircuitPython in 2022. Just like in past years, and there are some links to the uh, previous three years of documents in the notes, uh, Adafruit would like everyone in the community to contribute by posting their thoughts to some public place on the internet. Uh, here are a few ways you can post. A video on YouTube, a post on the CircuitPython forum, a blog post on your site, a series of tweets, of tweets, or a gist on GitHub. Please consider sharing your thoughts. When you post, please add hashtag CircuitPython2022 and email CircuitPython2022 at Adafruit.com to let the teams know about your post. And then we will blog it up on the Adafruit blog, and I think Scott will be doing some summaries uh, later. And so we call this a survey, but it's really free form. Um, you know, it's not, you fill out three pages of how satisfied are you from a scale of one to seven. Um, this is more an essay form. So check out those past uh, years and yeah, tell us what's on your mind, no matter what your experience level is. Um, we want to hear from you. So please do it. Uh, next up, uh, Tayobi declares Python programming the language of the year 2021. We've won uh, the second time in a row. This award is given to the programming language that has gained the highest increase in ratings in one year. C-sharp was on its way to get the title for the first time in history, but C-sharp 
uh, Python surpassed C-sharp in the last month. We started at position 3 at the beginning of 2021 and left both Java and C behind to come the number one of the Tyobi index. But Python's popularity didn't stop there. It is currently more than 1% ahead of the rest. Java's all-time record of 26.49% ratings in 2001 is still far away, but Python has it all to become the de facto standard programming language for many domains. Next, using both cores of a Raspberry Pi Pico in MicroPython. DIY Electronic Music has been doing MIDI slash musical visualization projects with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Dual use of an LED matrix and a 4x7 segment display was a bit slow, so they looked to use the unused core on the Pico to provide extra processing power. Um, one core, this is a quote from uh, DIY Electronic Music, one core is listening to the MIDI and updating the LED matrix. The other is keeping the eight segment LED scanning showing the latest MIDI command slash note received. And there are a bunch of links. Thanks for getting those for us, Foamy Guy. Uh, next up, we have product of the week, an LED choker. Uh, this is a very stylish and wonderful alphanumeric necklace that you can make yourself. Uh, they say, my new favorite project, a text display choker for status updates at the club. Uses an Adafruit alphanumeric display feather wing and a feather M0. Proto Grid hosts a button to switch patterns, and CircuitPython lets the owner edit the code to add new text. Another project, it is a keyboard. It is the CircuitPython plus Raspberry Pi Pico USB HID, a tiny 2 by 0.8 inch keyboard and there are links on YouTube, Hackaday.io, and Reddit. And there is a lot more. This is just a preview. So um, the, uh, that was not a great segue. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And anyway, what I was trying to say was, this is just a preview. There is a lot more in there. Um, so subscribe if you're not a subscriber and also send us your projects because, again, no matter your skill or experience level, what you are doing is cool and we really love hearing about it. And uh, yeah, that's it for the community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So we've got a lovely little script known as Adabot that uh, gathers statistics from GitHub every day covering the last seven days. And uh, I'll start off with these statistics that cover the whole project, which is the core, the libraries, and Blinka. We had 38 pull requests merged from 25 authors. And some names that are less frequent or unrecognized by me were The Infinity, S. Toklund, Pontus O, BJN Hur, Aaron Tusco, Electrical, Electric Algorithm, and uh, Danny Staple. And then in reviewers, I just want to uh, give a shout out to the kitty, our very own Ann B, for uh, doing some reviews here in CircuitPython land. And uh, with that, I will hand it to Scott to tell us about the core. Hello. Thank you, Jeff. Um, OK, so the numbers for the core, uh, we had 11 pull requests merged from 11 different authors, which is awesome. Uh, I won't highlight the new names here because Jeff already covered that. We had four reviewers for those 11 authors, so thank you to all of our reviewers for supporting our authors. Uh, we had 14 open poll requests. Uh, basically, three of them are 100 days or older. So as always, please, uh, if you're involved in some of these poll requests that have been around a while, please uh, circle back, decide whether they should be open or close them if we want to do them a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, so that's where we are in pull requests. Uh, Issues-wise, we had eight closed issues by four people, four opened by four people, for a, a net of 464 currently open issues, which you can see by going to github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues. Um, we track kind of where we are with uh, issues 
by making sure they're triaged and, and kind of prioritizing them using the milestone system on GitHub. Um, we, 7.1 is released, but we still got a milestone with zero open issues, which is good. Uh, we have a 7.2 milestone with four open issues, and we have 17 open issues for 7.x.x. Those are kind of like the most urgent things. And then we have one issue that's not assigned a milestone that we'll need to take a look at um, and sort out. But I think that's it um, for the core. All right. Thank you, Scott. Next up mm -hmm. is Katni to take on the topic of the libraries. Thanks, Jeff. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras such as our community bundle. Um, so this week we had 20 pull requests merged from 12 different authors and eight reviewers. Um, I want to call out that amongst those merged pull requests, eight of them are 22 days or older, and the oldest one was 304 days, um, which is amazing because it means we're getting through some of the older pull requests. And that leaves us with 33 open pull requests across all of those repos. There were 19 issues closed by nine people and 13 opened by 13 people, leaving us with 637 open issues. 239 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. If you want to join us in a reviewing capacity, check out the open pull requests and see if anything interests you. Um, if you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, uh, take a look at the code and let us know that you did. That is super helpful. If you want to contribute code, you can check out the issues. Good first issue is a great place to start if you've never uh, contributed before. Um, otherwise, bug or enhancement are also good things to search um, if you're looking for something a little more complicated. Leave a note on the issue that you're working on it, and we are always available to help you. We wrote a guide on, um, I wrote a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. As well, we are available on Discord um, all week long to assist you. Um, we want to make sure that you can contribute in a way that works for you. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had two new libraries added to the community bundle, uh, ANSI escape code and non-blocking serial input, and a number of updated libraries, which I will not read through. They are available in the notes. Um, overall, we're still getting through the older pull requests. So if you have an um, older library PR, expect to see some action on that sometime uh, soon. Um, which is really great to see and uh, early hug report to foamy guy for working through that. That's what I've got. Thank you. And then to finish this uh, section, I will invite Melissa to tell us about Blinka. And we can't hear you, Melissa, or at least I can't. All right, well, I uh, will just go ahead and read out that section then, and we'll come back to you when we get to hug reports. Uh, so Blinka is a Python library that, blings, that brings <laughs> uh, CircuitPython compatibility to the Raspberry Pi, MicroPython, and other single board computers. And in the last week, we had seven pull requests merged from four authors and three reviewers. Uh, leaving six open pull requests. And issues-wise, there were three closed issues by one person, leaving 69 open issues. The number of Pi Wheels downloads in the last month was 14,001, and the number of supported boards is 87. And that is the status of CircuitPython. Next up uh, is the section of Hug Reports. Hug reports are a kind of antidote to bug reports. We want to hear about people here on Discord, the community, and beyond who are doing positive things to make a difference. And uh, usually we concentrate on CircuitPython stuff, but you know, when you need to give a hug, yeah, we, we want to hear whatever it is. Uh, this week, I just have a group hug because y'all are great, and I've been enjoying the few CircuitPython 2022 posts that have come in so far and uh, yeah so an extra hug to everybody who has written those or who is writing those or who is on the fence to write one um, yeah so that's what I got next I will read notes from whoops, C Grover who is text only and C Grover has a hug to foamy guy for last Saturday's very informative stream 
Not only did it help to explain some missing details of CircuitPython board definitions, it also showed some examples of excellent code plus documentation in the CircuitPython PR pipeline, particularly that of 560. All right, and next up is Dan. Hello. Okay. Um, well, I'm jumping the gun on with something that Scott has been doing, which is to help our um, helpers in Discord. Uh, I'll mention uh, in the CircuitPython channels, Jerry, Naradoc, Deshipu, and Anecdata. And then in the other channels that are not CircuitPython related, but I'd like to also mention Ichiro Furusato and Mad Bodger, Ed Keys, Toddbot, Esker, and Ben Minus. And I'm sure there are others that I've forgotten at the moment. They've really made this a great community for people seeking both help with both with CircuitPython and with other things. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Here, here. Um, next, I have notes from David, who has a hug for Katni for making the floppy disk playlist on YouTube, and one for Foamy Guy and others that left ready to use vector IO sample code in issues. I made all of my tests based on resolved issues. They are known to be working minimal pieces of code. All right, and next is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, hug reports this week. First to a GitHub user 560, um, who did a, a PR recently on the APDS9960 library. Uh, they left a really, really nice PR with a lot of great details and uh, empirical testing data and all kinds of rationale for the changes they made uh, and stuff like that. So I wanted to highlight that person who did, uh, again, a really great job on a, a PR for that library. Um, to you, Jeff, uh, you had a post about the uh, the Matrix chat system, which I was not, not familiar with, um, other than KMK is the only time I ran into it, uh, and you had posted some information on Discord that uh, finally gave me a better idea of the bigger picture of, of what that system is and how it works, uh, and I appreciate that. To uh, Neerdoc, lastly, as well, for uh, testing out a PR on HTS 22 one library and then uh, Neerdoc also suggested a good improvement this weekend uh, for one of the recent changes to the DPS 310 library um, and we got that improvement put in over the weekend so uh, thank you to Neerdoc for that and that's what I have thank you that's great uh, thank you next I have notes from Jerry who is missing the meeting today but has a hug for Tanu for the continued improvement and expansion of the Broadcom port and to Dan for jumping in to add deprecation warnings to the tiny Laura guides and next we have Katni. Hello. Hello. So my first hug is to Mark Gambler for the updates to the IS31FL 3741 library and patience with me um, getting to sorting it out where sorting out where the updates should live. Uh, to Foamy Guy for continuing through the older library PRs. To Sheehan, one of our um, Learn developers for sorting out a script to convert a template page to a static page in Learn for an unusual situation I ran into with refactoring a specific template page. It saved me a ton of time and frustration in manually copying a very lengthy guide page. Um, to PT and Lamore for incredible support during a rough situation. To uh, Jeff, Dan, Anne, and John Park for further support and a group hug to everyone else. All right, thanks, Katni. Uh, next, I have notes from uh, Keith and then Melissa. Let me know if you want me to read your notes or whether you want to try it again. Anyway, Keith the EE says, hug report to everyone for being such a welcome and helpful community. All right. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I restarted my computer. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, I just want to give a group hug to everyone. All right. Thank you. Um, Next up, we have Scott. Hello. A hug report to Neradoc, to Shipu, and Anic Data for really being helpful uh, with folks in help with CircuitPython over the weekend. Uh, in particular, there was some person that was a little upset that it wasn't as easy as we had claimed it was. Uh, and they were super patient with them, which I, I admire because I don't always have that patience. And I'm realizing I should have thanked the CircuitPython 2022 folks as well, uh, but I'll wait till next week to do that. All right, and uh, Zoltan, you get to round out the section. Thanks, Jeff. So I haven't been around for, for quite a while. I, I couldn't, I just couldn't fit the meeting into my schedule, but um, first I would like to start out with a group hug. Um, 
Uh, it's good to be back. Um, and second, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Jeff's help um, uh, in the past six months. Um, he's been there always uh, on GitHub, at least. Um, whenever I asked a question, he was he was um, I don't know happy to jump in, but at least jumped in. So thanks for that, Jeff. All right, you're welcome. I'm laughing a little bit. Um because you and the other contributors, you do the bulk of the lifting and it's like I, I come in with one little piece. So uh, anyway, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, but that's the missing piece of the puzzle. So uh, that's quite crucial. All right. And with that, we will move on to status updates. In this section, we invite you to tell us about what you've been up to since the last time we had a chance to chat and what you're getting up to in the near future. And this is a round robin just like hug reports. I will start and then we'll go down through uh, the alphabet or at least the order that things are in here because it doesn't always follow the alphabet. Anyway, so uh, last week and this week uh, is centered around floppy disk drives. Last week I got basic flux reading working in CircuitPython. Flux are the little pulses of magnetic data that are on the, the floppy disk. And this week, the goal is to add real-time MFM decoding, and I have a plan. So when that's done, I'll be able to say questions like, okay, what is the actual content of track one, sector one, head one of the disk, and get it back as binary data. So that'll be cool if it works. Uh, when I do need a break, I'm going to see about implementing the PIO code for eight parallel NeoPixel strips without a shift register, and that will support the upcoming Feather Scorpio product. I have a pull request in Adafruit PIO ASM that I need to return to. And um, in other news, I did a pure C program with ESP IDF. It was a lot of fun, and there's a link in the notes document. It is, um, so a lot of GPSs have the ability to do a one pulse per second output. And my friend wanted something like that, but he wanted it to operate off of the Wi Fi network. So this thing gets the time with NTP and then it just makes a pulse every second for 100 milliseconds forever. It, it was fun to do just a simple C program. Anyway, uh, so that's what I've got. And next in the document is Dan, so we'll go slightly out of order. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. I can, all right, that's all right. Yes. Um, so um, uh, last, last week I uh, wrote a an example of using NeoPixels with async I.O. So you can control the speed and direction of a NeoPixel animation. That's sort of a canonical example. And that will get uh, reused in a bunch of places, probably. Uh, you can't see it yet because it's still being reviewed. Um, in CircuitPython 7.1.0, the PDM microphone stopped working on CPX and in general. And I'm really puzzled as to why I found one problem, but that didn't fix it. It was just making something a volatile. And so I need to do some more extensive debugging, like going back to a version that seems to work, which is also problematic, it turns out. And this was all stymied by some kind of new bug in the Linux kernel, where if I stop CircuitPython, like in GDB, and so the USB connection goes away, then the USB driver in Linux now gets so upset that it takes down all the device, takes down the entire USB controller, including all the devices on it, like my mouse and keyboard. So I have to SSH in from elsewhere and reboot. It's ridiculous. So I've upgraded to the um, upcoming Ubuntu 2204, which has a newer kernel. I had tried a new ker newer kernel in 2004, but and it seemed to be better, but there are other problems with using a random kernel that's not signed. So I'm trying 2204. So if other people see this problem, uh, let me know also. It's, they made some mistake, and I don't know what it is. OK, thank you. All right, next I have notes from a couple of people. First, C. Grover writes, a week of refactoring. Disassembled and rebuilt the retro RPN calculator code, followed by the redesign of three PCBs to accommodate a new round of scarce part availability issues. Upgraded two existing IoT projects to CircuitPython 7.1.0 and lined up four more for similar treatment. Depleted a large share of my maker budget with an Adafruit order and finally found a suitable round TFT display for the 6E5 Magic Eye project. A flexible PCB will be needed. Looking forward to the experience, my first. 
and then uh, David notes. Under the heading of CircuitPython, uh, testing display I.O. and vector I.O. on a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, changing screen resolution. Uh, and searching for floppy drives, floppy disks, and floppy cables. In non-CircuitPython news, drilling holes in thick walls, finding acceptable paths between rooms to place Ethernet backhaul for a Wi-Fi upgrade, and better conductiv connectivity where I am teleworking. And uh, next up is Foamy Guy, so take it away, Tim. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this uh, last week, I should say, uh, I wrapped up the guide for the Busy Simulator uh, Pi Portal and submitted that in for moderation, so that should be coming out soon. Um, continuing on with uh, PR testing and reviews, uh, like Katni mentioned, a couple that stood out to me this week that I will highlight are uh, DPS 310 library, uh, which now has a minimal basic version, which makes it easier uh, and or possible to use on some of the smallest builds. Um, and then you can also uh, import the advanced one to get all of the functionality from that driver. Um, and the APDS 9960, uh, which is the little uh, light-based uh, color and gesture recognition sensor, and that one uh, got some improvements that make it better at recognizing gestures and also uh, got kind of a, a really nice overhaul on the documentation page as well in that library. So some cool stuff this week, uh, or last week again, I should say. Um, for the stuff coming up this week, uh, two new projects uh, on the table, a uh, web telescope, the James Webb telescope that is currently, um, I guess, in space on its way somewhere. I'm not entirely sure where it's going, but it's part of the way there. And uh, I'll be able to keep up with the status of exactly where it's at using a new um, Pi Portal or MagTag uh, project that will show the current status of that. Um, and then another one that I think will be fun uh, coming down the pipeline this week is uh, some Llama-based nostalgia with a uh, Winamp skinned MP3 player for the Pi Portal. So um, there are apparently, which I, this was a little news to me, but there are apparently thousands of these Winamp skins out there that are just kind of ready-made little GUI um, packages with BMP files in them. Uh, so we can kind of reuse those and make a, an interesting little uh, Winamp mock player on the Pi Portal, which sounds like a fun project. Um, this week also I want to continue building out documentation for the Minecraft Feather. Um, I'm putting together a, a repo with some markdown files that show how to set it up. I think I also want to shoot a video that shows the setup process. It's a little bit involved to get everything going for it, so I think a video will be a good uh, format to show folks how they can make that themselves if they want. And this week I also need to write a, uh, a post for CircuitPython in 2022, and that's what I have going on. Thanks. All right. I hope you enjoy that Winamp project. I suggested you for it because you know so much more display I.O. than I do. So yeah. that was the genesis of the suggestion there. Yeah, I think it looks neat. I th definitely think it looks like a lot of fun to play with. I'm pretty excited. So thank you. Cool. All right. Katni, you are up next. All right. So last week was a short week for me. I sorted out a home for the iOS 31 updates, added some of the mirrored circuit Python pages to the cutie pie ESP guide and merged the ESP 32 S two bootloader install and the ESP 32 S two factory reset templates to prep from, for gutting the bootloader install template. What happened here was we ended up with two templates that had a, a significant amount of duplicated information and most folks are looking to factory reset. They want to get back to where their board started. Um, then they, more, more folks are in that, that situation than are folks who need to install the bootloader. So um, the bootloader install page is still going to exist. It's still going to go in all the guides, but it is instead going to point to the appropriate section in the factory reset um, template. So um, if folks are like, hey, I want to fix my bootloader, um, I clobbered it. Uh, they'll go if and they choose to go to that page. Um, it links to the appropriate spot on the other page, so there's no more duplicated information. That way, if we do need to update something, we're updating it in one place, not two, um, which is always our goal. So that was uh, merging the two in preparation for gutting the other one, um, which I didn't do yet because there's I have to actually go and link appropriately in the guides that the template already exists. Um, so this week. Um, starting the Feather TFT ESP32 guide. I'm going to get that 
done just enough to make it live. So um, real basic pages um, and then um, refactor the bootloader install template page and then fix the instances of it that are already existing in guides. Um, then I'm going to bounce back to the QtPy ESP guide and finish that up, which involves adding the CircuitPython Essentials templates and I think a couple other things. Um, and then once that's completed, bounce back to the Feather TFT guide and finish that. Um, once both of those guides are out of the way, um, I'm not quite sure the order in which the rest of this will be done, but the Arcade Stem and QT breakout uh, needs a guide. The MCP4725 has been updated to have Stem and QT connectors on it, and so that guide needs to be updated um, for the QT version. I need to create a CircuitPython Essentials dot star status LED template. There's already one for multiple LEDs, so really it's just copying and pasting and making LED and dot star singular, not plural. Um, so that'll be quick. And then um, creating a CircuitPython Essentials template for um, async IO, which uh, the example that Dan thought was going to be reused in multiple places is, is going to be reused there for sure. So um, that'll be the example for async IO um, that will go into all the board guides so everybody can uh, when they go to the board guides we'll see async IO exists and what you can do with it in basic uh, fashion um, and then any other miscellaneous stuff that comes up but this is definitely gonna last me for a week or two so you'll probably see quite a bit of this next week as well that's what I've got thank you Katni next is maker Melissa Hello. So uh, last week I finished up the Blinka Display I/O changes that I and was able to leave it in a working state. It's not completely uh, redone, but if any community members want to work on it, I'd be happy to provide guidance. Um, I added a bunch of the missing boards to CircuitPython.org, and I started working on porting little FS to JavaScript to use with Whippersnapper, and this week I'll continue porting little FS. And that's where I'm at. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Um, I'm just about wrapped up on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's still somewhat unreliable on the SD card, unfortunately, but it's not clear to me how bad it is. <laughs> and I don't really have any leads, so I'm going to leave that. Um, I do need to finish up the Learn Guide. That's, I think, going to be my goal today uh, so that we can get it in time for the shows on Wednesday. Uh, I also am working on a branch that enables Turkish builds. Um, Electric Algorithm has been requested and has been translating for Turkish, and I know that uh, it's great for the translators to be able to actually get access to the builds for that. So I think it's ready. I, I took a look, and the core messages seem to be there, um, although I'm sure there's some work to do. But I, it's, I think it's motivating to see that, so uh, I want to do that today if... I might have to do some, I'm hoping I don't, but I might have to do some uh, tweaking to get things to fit, but we shall see. I, that's why I'm, I have a build going right now just off my own branch. Um, so that's going on. Um, after this Raspberry Pi stuff is kind of like uh, finished up, there's one PR to get in and that should be easy. Uh, it's all green, so I think it'll go in shortly. Um, once I'm past that, I'm gonna ramp up back, back up on the ESP32 S3. Um, I watched Desk of Lady Ada last night, and I'm pretty excited about all the different cutie pies that uh, she's been making. And so although I'll be working primarily on the S3 a lot, I'm hoping a lot of the work that I do uh, does translate to the C3 and the ESP32. Um, in particular, I'm looking at adding BLE support, which would be really cool. So um, I'm going to make sure there's no major bugs on the S3, that it works OK. Uh, hammer those out if they come up. but. Uh, I think BLE will be my focus besides that. Um, I also want to do my CircuitPython 2022 posts this week. I know uh, there's been a few coming in, so thank you to all those folks. I've got a couple more small ones to post on the blog today. Um, and I do want to let everybody here know first, uh, one of the major things that's going to be in my 22 is that I, I'm not actually going to be working uh, the entire year because my partner and I are expecting our first kiddo in March, um, <laughs> which I'm very excited about, but it means that I'll basically be out April plus or minus two weeks, depending on when the baby comes, 
and then it's looking again this is d depending on when the baby comes but i'll be taking a 12-week stretch off kind of later in the summer as my partner goes back to work um that's looking like if the baby hits their due date it would be like late august through september and october that i would be out so um not a whole lot of major projects for me because I will be figuring out how to be a dad as well. Um, but I wanted to let everybody here know that, that, that uh, when you hear me talk about what my personal plans are in terms of what I'm going to be working on this year, that's a major, major factor um, in it. So I'm excited. Uh, we're excited. So my, my hope is that my goal is to get kind of the S3 BLE stuff wrapped up before I go on leave. Um, which we'll see. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, last up, um, the Washington State Legislature is back in session and they are starting to do committee hearings around some broadband and digital equity stuff that I just can't not testify for. Um, there's also a right to repair bill in committee on Thursday. So I'm gonna be a little distracted with that, but I'm hoping it's not gonna to be too bad. Um, it's all Zoom, so it's just gonna be me in uh, committee meetings and hoping to testify and, and provide some influence over what these bills include. Um, and if you wanna know more about that, I'm happy to. I know, I think C. Grover is actually in Washington too, so if you wanna know more about that, I'd love to talk about it. All right. Well, I'll just say on behalf of everybody who may be listening in stunned silence, congratulations to <laughs> you and your partner and all the best wishes for, for that stuff. What an adventure you're going to have. I know. Fingers, fingers crossed that the hospitals aren't too bad by the time that we decide to have a kid. <laughs> by the time the kid decides to come. Yeah. That way. All right. Let's not worry about that just yet. Anyway, once again, to round out the section, uh, V923Z, take it away. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So I have just uh, released version uh, 4.0 of MicroLab that adds um, optional complex support. Um, this has been a recurring request from the community. I, I um, was uh, fighting this off, but uh, unfortunately, I had to realize that there are, there are functions that produce complex results, even if the input is is real so um, it, it turned out to be inevitable um, this this version also adds a couple of new functions and um, with the help of um, some members of the circuit python community um, not least jeff um, we squashed quite a few uh, smaller bugs so uh, that that's uh, that's what's included in 4.0 and uh, recently people have opened quite a few feature requests so um in the coming weeks i i, I will be working on those um and that's that's about it from me all right uh thank you we probably need to figure out when to pull request version 4 into circuit python soon as well so uh give us a reminder if someone namely me doesn't get around to that um all right Anyway, with that, we will uh, pass on to In the Weeds. This is the time that we uh, do longer discussions that don't fit within the other portions of the meeting. And it looks like we've got a couple of topics. And I will then pass things back to you, Zoltan, because you are up first. Well, if, if Tim wants to move up his topic, then that's fine with me. Oh, no, I think. Uh, oh, do you need to, Dan? Uh, you decide. No, I was going to say uh, either way is fine with me. Okay. Well, um, if you if you have to leave earlier or something like that, then then just go ahead. Oh, I am uh, I'm good to go. Okay. Um. So um. I, actually, I I think I have formulated my question in and in, in writing. Um, um. What is the best uh, platform independent way of of writing data uh, to to a file uh, and um. I, I have one way which which works in 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 Unix, but I I don't know if it's if it's really platform independent. That's that's what I listed and um, then then posted a different solution. So I, I just wanted to ask what what is the difference between um, using a stream uh, or, or um, using first MP get stream um, and then going with that um, uh, pointer or uh, using um, 
uh, f right or f uh, yeah right f right um, uh, to 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 write the data to to a file. Uh, what are what are the differences? Um, I, I try to to wrap my head around this, uh, but um, I have to admit that um, um, it's 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 probably too deep in the um, in the in the source code of MicroPython, and uh, I couldn't really dig out all the details. Uh, so um, uh, basically, I, I just tried to hijack the uh, vid open. Um, uh, context uh, manager and I, I think this is what uh, uh, MP built in open does but um, uh, I am not quite convinced that that's the that's the best way so if, if anyone could comment on this I, I would be grateful um, and um, as uh, to, to give context to the issue um, uh, someone wanted to to actually write um, um, numerical data or uh, uh, arrays uh, into a file in order to um, exchange data between the PC and uh, and and, and a micro or um, um, a microcontroller, and uh, we decided that the best pro uh, way probably would be to to use a standardized uh, NumPy save uh, function and. Um, that has a very well-defined format, uh, which which I implemented, but I still have to write the data to disk. So, um, if anyone could comment on that, I would be grateful. Dan, so, do you want to go ahead? Want to, did you want to write to a file specifically, or to some stream? I didn't know what. I I, 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 I want to write to a file. So, what what uh, um, um, NumPy dot uh, save does it takes a, a, a two arguments a file name that's a string actually uh, so you have to open that the file with that name and the the array and then writes the contents and and uh, some header um, into that particular file so I I, I I don't really need streams it just seemed to me that um, I could use streams, but um, I'm not claiming that that's <laughs> that's that's a, that's a proven solution. So um, if if you say that um, f open and f write is better, then I'm they're just a little more they're closer to what's going on at the lower level. But if okay. there's any like if that if that if there are other NumPy functions that write to a stream, then maybe you would want to do it in a different way. That take an opened. An, an, an open file or something like that. Okay. So I, I looked up how to do it only to do this writing to boot out dot text. So that's the only mm -hmm. reason I added that is that I had to look this up a few years ago. Okay. So okay. The, the distinction between those two pieces of code, um, one, well, they're kind of the same thing and Dan was getting at it a little bit. There's what are you writing to? Is it any any kind of thing or is it in this case a, the, a mounted DOS file system? So in Dan's uh, code, there is this initial FS argument. And in, right. the, in the code that writes out the boot out.txt, we already, we already, excuse me, we know that where we are writing, the location of that is within the CircuitPy drive. If okay. you were to mount an SD card, um, then you would have to figure out which FS object is associated with the SD card. There'd be more than one. But when you use the open, when you call built-in open like you do, then mm -hmm. it does these steps of interpreting the path. So if it starts slash SD and you've mounted an SD card there, it will automatically switch the access over to the SD card. And that is a very nice thing to have. Otherwise, okay. somebody would come back and say, I tried it with an SD card and it doesn't work. Um, okay. So I have a full example of doing this to write things um, in the GIF IO module in CircuitPython. Okay. So if you want to see how I did it there, I would recommend right. taking a look, but it's very similar. Okay. I use MP get stream raise to get that okay. object that has the right uh, thing in it. And of course, for my purposes, I have to check if it's opened in byte mode or not, because mm -hmm. if I wasn't in control of the opening, then it could be in either mode. You're going to be in control of it. Yeah, and then I just call the proto points at right and later close. Okay, uh, right. So that that would have been my next question. I, I have to close the the stream, right? So um, because the, the the context manager does that, but that that doesn't work at the C level. So that's um, true. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So so what's missing from my code is definitely this uh, this um, 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 instruction to close the file or the, this uh, to close the mm -hmm. stream. 
Yeah, and that's a okay. little bit weird. It involves calling an IOCTL, but if you look at that GIF IO okay. code, uh, it's working and tested. Um, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Now that that's great. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I think with that, I would just pass it on to to Tim. Um, wait, thanks. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I I wanted to add a couple things to this as well. Okay. Um, the the solution that you have that uses the stream stuff, I would imagine the MicroPython people want you to do as well because they also support non-FATFS file systems. Yeah, that's right. Um, so th that is m what I imagine as well. And then the other thing I would caution is that I think these calls may end up back in the Python VM. So just make sure that you're aware of that. Um, uh, that what you does may that be mean? It means that like you're in you're you're in C, but you may end up actually running Python code. Okay. Uh, I, I, that doesn't I, always happen, so just be aware of that. Okay, but what are the ramifications of that? Uh, all, all my kittens will be killed, or or um, what what will happen if if that happens? Uh, I don't really know. Um, I think general. I, I think it's less likely in CircuitPython because we're just fat focused and the implementation, the underlying fat stuff is all in C again. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are kind of going through, you may go through one layer of indirection because I think write can be Python implemented. Okay. Um, and it, so it's just, it's just a like Python concurrency thing, right? You have to be aware that like some Python code could be running intermingled with other Python code. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. I mean, so yeah, it's, it's just so like, if weird stuff happens, that might be why. <laughs> the SD card support in MicroPython is written in Python, and right. so that's an example of where you go from Python into C and back out to Python. Right? So. Okay. Um. Well. Um. This this, this might um might be a a, a bigger um, subject, but actually, I, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, how, what is the way of, of um, uh, mixing Python and C code? So, uh, NumPy uses this uh, notion of, of um, um, passing arguments in Python mainly, and doing only the low-level stuff in C. But that means that you you have a library which which uh, which is part Python, part C, but part C, um, and I, I couldn't uh, yet figure out how to how to do that in MicroPython. So um, because um, well, MicroLab is, is is actually compiled into the firmware. So that's not separate as 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 is my, uh, NumPy from Python. Um, and um, at, at, at the same time, you, you have Python code, or you would have Python code and C code, and you would wo uh, want these to 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 be under the same um, namespace. Um, so um, I think what what uh, them pointed to was that I, I could do the um, the file handling in Python and simply uh, generate the row string or the row um, uh, byte string in 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 C and then pass it on to Python and that would write the data to to wherever it has to write the data. But that would require that I, I mix Python code with C code, and I, I'm not quite sure I, I know how to do that or if it's possible at all. Um, well, it, it, it's already done. For instance, SD card access in MicroPython does that, and there are other examples of frozen or not frozen. Um, Okay, so MicroPython so, so, code that gets called from C. I can't remember another example, but okay, they actually have some other. I think there's some other examples. So, okay, so that's an interesting notion. And that, uh, so, so you are saying that it's possible, and then I should just uh, look up uh, the the uh, uh, SD card uh, handling. Right. Well, it works because it's it right when when it's doing a write to a stream, the stream code just takes a stream object of which an open file is could be a Python object, and it knows okay. how to deal with that. OK. No, so that sounds I, great. I'm trying to remember if there's some other examples, but there was you know, several times I've seen recently in MicroPython, it was like, we don't need to write this in C. We can just write it in Python, but it might get called from C. Mm -hmm. So okay. I wish there were some other examples, and maybe there would be 
like if you ask in the MicroPython forum or something, or look in there, you might find some similar examples. Okay, uh, that, that, that's a great idea. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I think I, I should really pass it on to Tim now. <laughs> uh, thanks for the comments. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Fomi guy. Yeah, I think, um, let me pull the notes back up. So the root of this issue is essentially, do we want to include requirements in libraries if those required libraries are only used for typing? So an example of this, which I linked in the doc there, is to the requests library. The requests library recently got typing, and some of the types come from things like the, the WizNet uh, library or the ESP32 spy library. Um, and those are only used for typing inside requests. You can, you can, it's perfectly fine for you to write a code pie that uses requests, um, and you will probably have one, one or more of those libraries in order to connect to the internet on your CircuitPython microcontroller, but it won't rely on anyone in particular um, for requests to actually import since it's only used for the typing. So the root of the question is essentially, do we want to have those as you know, quote unquote, real requirements, put them in requirements.py and um, I guess maybe set up pi or somewhere. I'm not sure if there's other places where it would need to get listed so that those get installed. Um, ultimately, we need them all to get installed inside of the actions container when Sphinx runs. Uh, I think we need them all in there at least so that it can include the right links and the right types uh, for everything that it has access to. Um, do we want it to be okay, like if you are not that, if you're just running it on a microcontroller, you're not worried about the Sphinx container or building the docs, is it okay for it to get distributed without those requirements, essentially? Uh, that's kind of the first high level question. And then I think there might be follow-ups, I guess, depending on which one of those two directions we kind of side on. Well, I'm pretty sure that for Circup, we wouldn't want to install all of those onto the CircuitPy drive um, is kind of my first thought. And then my second thought is this is probably, this might be something that would be, be better handled by defining an interface, I think was the technical term within typing, which we did for something just recently in CircuitPython. There was a, a case of, can I, font? It would, yes, it was for font, font. exactly. Yeah. Um, there, somebody wanted to add static typing to say a font is required here, and they had a choice of listing built-in font and BDF font and T, uh, PCF font. But the other alternative is to create a, an interface object which just lists the, the methods and properties that something has to have to work with this. And so basically you'd say it, the, the type would be a socket interface instead of listing out all these individual things. And that is what I would be tempted to do. Okay. So that, and that would, if I understand correctly, that would remove the re, remove it as a requirement entirely. Essentially the right. requests would go back to being fully self-contained with everything it needs. Right. That block um, from line 46 to 51 would not be there. It would be replaced with other stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I like that so that we don't have a bunch of extra added on uh, requirements. And then um, I guess it just kind of depends if we ever run into a situation where it's not quite like that or kind of like if there's any others that have come up. But um, it may be the case that any kind, anytime we run into something like this, it might be better to side with just making that. Um, little prototype or whatever the the little internal one is um there's also a requirements.txt within the docs folder i noticed that one i didn't know how it behaves exactly though or is it's it okay for, to it's ask... for sphinx yeah i saw sphinx you, listed in you, there but i didn't know yeah. if, it, if it could take you, you could stuff. add stuff it's not ideal because okay. um if we do need to update that then it would the patch would skip it because it's different but yeah that makes in, sense like, obviously, we have files like this that are different in different libraries when there are one-off situations where there's no other options. It sounds like we have another option here, so I would I would opt yeah. for that. 
but for your own future reference, if we do run into a situation where we legitimately need to have some kind of requirements for strings to work and it's on a you know library that is meant to run on smaller boards and we can't add new requirements because you know project bundles would then download them and you know everything would be out of memory and so on um then that is available okay that's good to know all right so then i think um yeah i think that answers uh i think that answers it for me it, it sounds like probably the action item is just to eventually make a pr for a request that changes that over to use um more generically defined uh, types right inside of requests instead of importing so i will uh i will throw that on my list and i think that is uh everything i wondered about for today all right great and that was the second item in in the weeds so now it's time to wrap it up and i just need to find my spiel for this this has been the circuit python weekly for january 10th 2022 thank you to everyone who participated if you want to support adafruit and circuit python and those of us that work on circuit python consider purchasing from the adafruit shop at adafruit.com uh, the video of this meeting will be released on youtube at youtube.com adafruit and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on uh, Tuesday, I believe that is January 18th, uh, at the same usual time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, because on Monday we will be observing uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the United States. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join 24-7 by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see everybody next week. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, everyone.